morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second session of our conference. Uh, my name is Adima Tan. I'm the Science and Technology Attaché at the British Embassy in Tel Aviv. Um, today, we're going to look at genetically modified organ organisms and the lessons that we can learn from them when we go ahead and look at nanotechnology. Um, yesterday, um, yesterday's session, for those of you who, who weren't here, um, uh, there was um, a general overview of risk analysis and the risks involved in nanotechnology. And um, of course, yes, yes, yes. Can you hear me now? Is this better? Okay. Um, so I was just mentioning what happened in yesterday's session and among other things, misconceptions that have to do with nanotechnology. And as I said, this morning we're going to talk about genetically modified organisms and look at that as a lesson as to what we can learn when we're looking at nanotechnology. Um, we'll start with an overview and definition of genetically modified organisms, and then we'll go on and look at US perspectives, European perspectives and Israeli perspectives on genetically modified organisms. Um, so I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Nina Federoff from Penn State University. Um, she's a leading geneticist and molecular bio biologist, and she has uh, various uh, numerous awards, which I think uh, I won't go into all of them. Uh, among other things, she's a member of the Board of the National Science Foundation and has done seminal work in plant genetics. So, may, may I ask you to come and present your talk? Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, this is going to be, in, in, in a highly encapsulated form, a little introduction <coughs> to the background of the field, where we came from, what we could do now, how we can do it, and I apologize for its superficiality, but I think that it's important to have at least an idea because not everyone here is a plant biotechnologist. Um, what we are exposed to in the media today are, are extraordinary streams from the, from the promise of uh, actually solving problems that we've never been able to solve through uh, traditional plant breeding or uh, um, the, the, the approaches that have been used so far um, to the opposite extreme of uh, groups believing that this is the worst thing that's ever happened, that we're polluting our food supply and so forth and so on. So we're, what, is, what is it that we're talking about? What are we actually doing? And um, what does it mean? How, how different is it? Many people believe that it's very different from what we've done before. And let me give you a little bit of background, some definitions. For, first of all, what is a GMO? Today, technically, what it is, is a genetically modified organism. Now, what it means today is, is something very specific, and that is a crop or, or other organism um, that has been modified using techniques, molecular techniques, that have been developed in the past roughly 40 years. Now, it's, the first question to ask is whether, whether the modification of plants is new. And I would submit to you that, that plant genetic modification is uh, about as old as civilization. Indeed, um, civilization is built on our ability to modify plants uh, and, and, and uh, make them more productive for our own purposes as opposed to their own reproductive purposes. Now, probably what you would consider our most traditional uh, and most familiar GMO is in this part of the world, wheat, and in other parts of the world, corn. I pick corn as an example very simply because its transformation from its wild state to our present cultivated uh, varieties is so dramatic. So on the left is Teosinti, the closest relative of maize. And it basically, uh, this makes it look more like a corn plant than it usually does. It looks like a grassy bush, and it is. With, uh, with the usual habit of reproduction um, being in the, the reproductive structures at the top. Now, today's modern corn plant has these extraordinary things called ears, which are essentially the bearers of the, of the human food sticking out of the sides of it. And these are actually modified shoots. The difference, genetic difference between these two plants 
is actually quite small. And there are people that study the, the divergence of these and what it took exactly to convert one to the other. But it's actually a fairly small number of genetic changes. But of course, one of the most important ones is that the seeds stick to the, that it has a non-shattering rachis. This is the teosinte reproductive structure, and it shatters when it is mature to scatter the seeds. Now, obviously, seed scattering is to the advantage of the plant. It isn't to the advantage of the people trying to collect the seeds for food. And that is the, one of the primary modifications that happens in all of uh, plant breeding to produce the plants that produce food for people who then harvest the plants. In other words, the very, um, the very process of inventing and developing agriculture is based on uh, the genetic modification, genetic modifications which render the plant less able to survive in the wild and able to, to and dependent on people for reproduction. Now, the techniques that have been used traditionally um, to produce, to, to, to um, identify genetic modifications are observation, and we have had to rely historically on the mutation, the basal mutation rate. But the mutations that are produced by contemporary means and by traditional means are indistinguishable. In fact, some of the mutations underlying the, the green revolution strains have recently been identified, and they, are, they belong to the standard categories. They're mutations. They're, de they're largely deletions. That is, bits of pieces of DNA that are missing that inactivate a gene. And that is the underlying uh, mechan genetic mechanism under dwarfing, which was so important in producing the uh, strains that uh, we call the green revolution strains. Now, um, the other thing that many people are unaware of is the extent to which, over the past half century, human beings have learned how to accelerate the evolutionary process. And just to give you a, a tiny example, this is a very familiar and highly prized variety of grapefruits. It's not not uh, grown very broadly, but it's uh, a special treat that people tend to send to their relatives at, at various holidays. Um, the way this was created was by actually sending um, cuttings of, the, of, of grapefruit plants to the Brookhaven National Laboratory, irradiating them and shipping them back to Texas and planting them out and looking for the mutations that the radiation causes. About half of the strains that are in production today were created using some form of mutagenesis. This is now called and considered part of traditional plant breeding. <coughs> what, do, what do radiation and chemical mutagenesis do? They create mutations in the genome. They break chromosomes. They actually promote their reassembly in different ways. And what is the important take-home lesson there? And that is that, it's, that the extent of genome rearrangement is quite extraordinary. It, is, it has been, we are now able to watch it in evolution. We can do it rapidly. And basically the bottom line is that you can mix up genomes quite extensively and still have the same organism. So it matters more what genes you have, how they are expressed, and not what they are. That is not a blanket generalization. Physician effects do matter, but in general, just adding or rearranging the DNA doesn't eliminate the ability of the organism to produce, to, to reproduce and, and grow. Now, what are the basics of recombinant DNA technology? This is basically the toolkit. Cloning is doing nothing more than taking a piece of DNA and making many, many copies of it. The underlying inventions that allowed people to do this and to actually make enough of a single gene, you have many, uh, many, many thousands of genes. Any plant, any crop plant has many, many thousands of genes. People are arguing about whether it's 30,000 or 40,000 or 50,000, but it's many thousands of genes. It is virtually impossible to understand what a gene is, what its sequence is, without actually breaking down and, and, and isolating a single piece of that DNA. And these are the techniques that allow that to be done. Um, basically, it consists of the, the awareness that there are small extra chromosomal um, pieces of DNA called plasmids. These are in bacteria. They're in other kinds of organisms as well. People learn how to 
uh, isolate them and work with them, particularly with restriction enzymes. Now, these are enzymes that cut very specific sequences in the DNA, and they allow you, because they create, when they cut, they cut asymmetrically, basically leaving an overlapping piece of DNA protruding so that you can actually reassemble different kinds of molecules together. You can take a piece of foreign DNA, paste it into a plasmid, and then re-ligate that plasmid with a, an enzyme appropriately called ligase. And then that is introduced into a bacterial cell, which is permeabilized to allow the DNA to get in. And this is actually the cloning step. At this point, you have a mixture of, if you start with a complex DNA, you've fragmented it in little pieces, distributed them amongst many, many plasmids, <coughs> and reintroduced them into bacteria. This is done with viruses and it's done with uh, plasmids, but basically the same, uh, the same principles apply. What you then do is reintroduce that, that mixture of DNA molecules into bacteria and then spread the bacteria out in a very thin layer so that each single bacterial cell then grows in isolation until it becomes many millions of cells. And then each of those millions of cells in that one uh, group of cells, which is called a colony, contains the same DNA molecule. Now you have basically, as you would on a paper copier, made many, many copies of that DNA, and you can analyze it, you can sequence it, you can change its sequence, and so forth. Very superficial introduction, but there's one more piece that you need to know about plants, and that is in order to understand what, what is done with plants, and that is you have to know something about nature's uh, uh, genetic engineer, and that is agrobacterium. Agrobacterium is a soil bacterium, which is itself a, it is a pathogen. It's not a le lethal pathogen, but in general, it, it, it depresses the productivity of the plant because it transfers, here's what it, how it works on the molecular level. The bacterium itself carries a very large plasmid called the TI plasmid, and it transfers a piece of DNA into the plant cell and in the, in, the, in the wild, this particular piece of DNA is actually carrying genes that deregulate the ability of the plant to control its reproductive rate, and it grows a tumor. And that's what you see here. Now, what people have, and the way it works is that these, the genes that cause that tumor growth are carried on this piece of DNA that the bacterium transfers to the plant cell, <coughs> that piece of DNA actually integrates into the plant genome and becomes part of it. Now, in nature, what that also, that piece of DNA also carries um, are some genes that code for proteins that produce compounds that the bacterium uses as a sole food source. So essentially what in, happens in nature is that this piece of DNA subverts the uh, plant cell to make food for the bacterium. It's, um, it's, it turns the, the the plant cell into a food factory. What people have done is become parasites of that parasite, and they replace that piece of those genes. They make it such that the, the genes that cause the tumor are no longer there, because we know how to do that actually artificially so we can control it. And then you introduce the DNA that you want, and then the, the tDNA mechanism underlying that. It's a fairly sophisticated mechanism. It's a, modification of a plant mating, a bacterial mating system, carries the DNA into the plant cell for you. Um, now what it looks like in the laboratory is you basically take pieces of leaf, in this case this is a tobacco leaf, not because it's tobacco, but because this happens to be a plant that's very easily transformed, and you dip it in a suspension of bacterial cells carrying the plasmid you want, carrying the genes that you would now like to introduce into the plant. And then you put it on a medium that allows just those cells to grow and to grow in a rel relatively uncontrolled manner. You then withdraw those chemicals, they're just growth hormones, <coughs> and the plant then uh, spontaneously forms shoots and regenerates into a complete fertile plant. And what you have now is the same plant, but now you've added a gene to it. That's called a transgenic plant. I've oversimplified, this is not the only technique used, but this is one of the major techniques used to introduce genes into DNA, into plant DNA. Now remember this is a, 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 genetic, en, an, a genetic engineering system that is in, is in nature. It transfers DNA across species barriers and um, 
that's something that people are largely unaware of happening, actually, in nature, but it does. And all we've learned to do is we've learned enough about it so that we can actually use it to carry in the genes that we select. Okay, now I, what I'm going to do at, here is just to, to, to give you an example of what can be done by these techniques. Just tell you the story of one of the, actually one of the few really successful academically driven um, plant modifications that got into production. Man, much of what is occurring today is occurring in companies largely because they are the only ones that can afford to get through the regulatory process and that we'll come back to. But this is actually uh, a project that was, that grew out of um, a collaboration between the University of Hawaii and Cornell University to develop a new approach to controlling a very um, ancient and difficult to control uh, disease called uh, papaya ring spot virus. And you can see why it's called that. I think that it's reproducing well enough so that you can see the rings on the, um, of the papaya itself. Now, a healthy papaya plant looks like this, and an infected one looks like that. Um, it's a very difficult to control pest because it is transmitted by um, insects. Now, the story of the, the, the background of papaya ring spot virus in Hawaii, it's, it has been detected all over the world. It was, um, it, um, did not, did not uh, overtake the papaya plantations in Hawaii for about a, a, dozen, a dozen years before, after it was discovered there. But by the 1950s, uh, it had essentially wiped out the papaya industry uh, on Oahu, and then it, the industry moved to the Big Island, where, it was, where the disease was successfully controlled for uh, some 30 years until um, about the early 90s, and, it, and, and the papaya ring spot virus was discovered in some plantations in the early 90s. Now, in the meantime, Dennis Gonzalez at the University of, uh, oh, let, me, let me just introduce to you how, to, how it's spread. This is an aphid. It feeds on the plants. Um, this is the virus itself. As the, as the aphid feeds, it, it introduces the virus into the plants, uh, plant cells where it reproduces, <coughs> the coat protein is removed from around the virus. This is a different virus, but the principles, same principles obtained. It's a, a virus that doesn't use DNA, which is what everyone is familiar with, but it actually uses another nucleic acid, RNA, as its, as its uh, genetic material. In the plant cell, the virus reproduces and then it's ready to be picked up by another insect vector and spread uh, to the next plant. Now, it's very difficult to control because this can be spread over very long distances by just a few insects. And once a, once a plantation is infected, it's very difficult to control because you have to essentially uh, kill almost healthy trees in order to keep it from spreading. Many, many... Um, decades and millions of dollars had been spread, spent before the contemporary techniques came into use trying to develop resistant varieties without much success. So in, in uh, probably the late 70s, early 80s, Dennis Gonzalez heard that um, some, yeah, I'm, I think I'm doing okay, um, that <coughs> geneticists at, at Washington University, specifically Roger Beachy, had um, been working on uh, virus resistance in plants. It has been known for a very long time that, that a, a plant infected by a, a virus and surviving it is protected, kind of in, in, by analogy, although the mechanism is different, to the immune system of, of animals. And um, he and what Roger had done is guess that it worked much like the immune system, taken the co-protein gene and introduced it in the plant. If you think about that a little too much, it, the logic of it dissolves. Nonetheless, it worked. And it wasn't known for a long time why it worked. But we know now, and let me just run through the, the history of, of the, this particular project. So Dennis uh, heard about this. He got the vectors from Roger. He persuaded a friend of his to introduce them in, into papaya plants. We'll skip over the technology of that. It took them 11 years to, before they had their first transgenic plants. And in 1992, uh, just to remind you, that's when PSRV, uh, PRSV was first detected on a fairly large scale in the, in the plantation on the Big Island of Hawaii. 
The first field trials were approved and, and carried out in 1992. And in 1994, it took them a couple of years to get through, the, through simply the USDA permission uh, process, um, they started large-scale uh, field trials. Now, in its wisdom, uh, USDA allowed them to produce seed, seeds for distribution, assuming that they would get re regulatory approval, which took another two years. But once they got the regulatory approval, they were ready to distribute the seeds. Now, in that interval of time, essentially farmers had started going out of business. The new seeds were released free of charge to growers in 1998, and by 2000, the papaya industry had actually bounced back to pre-1995 levels. That's a really amazing story. And just to give you a, a tiny insight into the underlying biology, which we didn't really understand until um, probably the last couple of years. And that is that the, the, the plants and animals as well have a system which actually recognizes, specifically recognizes RNA molecules. If it's seen it before, it will recognize it. And instead of allowing that, uh, any piece of the, the DNA will actually suffice. As, I mean, it, any piece of the RNA will actually suffice as long as it is produced at high levels in the plant. And what that allows the plant to do is to recognize the incoming virus and trash its, its genome before it gets off the ground rather than allowing it to reproduce. Essentially, it doesn't introduce a protein. It simply introduces, stimulates the mechanism the plant normally has to recognize that virus and, and prevent its reproduction. I think that's kind of miraculous myself. It's a, very simple tech, it's a very simple principle, but actually when these experiments were started, we didn't even understand it. That's a sick plantation. This is a transgenic plantation. It's been a remarkable story, and um, there are many more such stories to be written once people uh, recognize that, that this is a technique that, that uh, doesn't really uh, do the kinds of things that people are worried about. Now, I don't have time to go through all of the things that people worry about, but I'm just, I'm just listing the major categories. People have worried about whether DNA is safe to eat, largely because they don't know that everything you eat contains DNA. Um, so that's a safety issue. Do antibiotic genes get into people? <coughs> that has been an issue that has been discussed for about 25 years. It's largely um, a... Um, it, it isn't an issue because the kinds of antibiotics that were originally used are not used widely in medicine, and furthermore, the route of transmission, although people have tried very hard to detect transmission of DNA from plants into bacteria in the gut, uh, none of the studies have, have surfaced any uh, credible evidence that that happens at a, at a, a detectable level. Um, do GM foods contain new toxins? Foods contain toxins. There is nothing uniquely introduced by the genetic modifications that would change, would introduce a new toxin, um, unless that particular gene that is introduced encodes a toxic protein. And of course, toxic proteins, proteins can be toxic to one kind of organism and not to the other. That's the basis of making plants resistant to uh, insects. And then the the real issue, and that's where the most time is spent, is allergenicity. Does, will a new protein um, cause allergies, unexpected allergies, in, in the recipient population, or the, the consuming po population? And that's a whole, that's subject of a whole lecture, but suffice it to say that there are, there, although we do not understand it perfectly, there's enough of a knowledge base so that to flag any protein with potential allergenicity. And the testing procedures depend on what the probability is that it's allergenic. Other th issues that are raised are, could genes escape from transgenic plants to cause problems? This is now called gene flow. But I would uh, remind you that crop plants and wild plants have existed side by side for many, many years. Uh, thousands of years, and the problems introduced by introducing now new genes are not different from the problems that, that uh, underlie the, the, the whole base of, of separating agricultural plants, desirable plants, from, from wild plants. 
Now, could, could GM crop plants reduce biodiversity? There's two issues here. Now, I'm not answering all these questions. I'm just putting them on the table. And there are two issues that people raise. One is, is crop diversity. And that, that's a problem for all of monoculture. Uh, and the way it's handled today is, is very different from the way that, that most people perceive it. But I think that the, that the bigger issue is um, the biodiversity of what wildlands remain, uh, either in managed or in unmanaged ecosystems. And I would submit to you that, that these techniques, by allowing more food to be grown on the, plant, on the, on the acreage that's already under cultivation have the potential for uh, allowing us to preserve what wildlands we have left. Now, boy, this is a rapid tour. The history, of, a skeletal history of, of recombinant DNA regulation, it actually started in the academic community back in the early 1970s. Um, when I was a graduate student, I remember there were all kinds of raging discussions, largely at Cold Spring Harbor, because that's a place where is, is a crossroads for the scientific community in the U.S. Um, out of those discussions, which occurred among the, actually the people who were inventing the techniques, particularly Paul Berg, but then joined by people like uh, Maxine Singer and uh, Norton Zinder, and there's a whole group of, a uh, small group of people who pulled together and then organized a conference in 1974, which, out of which grew the um, a request to the NIH to put together a process for examining the potential for harm that could come from the from recombinant DNA. This is well before the first plant gene had been cloned. So this had to do with with um, using mammalian DNA, for example, and cloning it in bacteria or uh, cloning pieces of viruses and so forth in in bacterial cells. Now that started a process which culminated in the, in the, in the uh, formation of the Recombinant DNA Advisory Committee within the NIH. Now this is an advisory body. It had no legal standing. The only well, all it could do was advise the director of the NIH. The only sanctions that the NIH director had to impose were withholding uh, granting from, from an individual who failed to comply with the guidelines. But curiously enough, it worked, and it was actually was a member of that recombinant DNA advisory committee in the early 1980s when the first plant request to, to approve plant uh, um, approve the testing of transgenic plants in in the um, in actually in the ground rather than in contained facilities came in. Now the reason that this um, advisory structure worked is because people agreed to abide by it. Companies actually came to the recombinant DNA advisory committee uh, because they could then very simply say, well, we complied with all of the guidelines and that was sufficient to keep things um, out in the open. All of the meetings of the recombinant DNA advisory committee were open to all comers, as are all uh, advisory committee meetings of the government, or essentially all of them. Now, in about 84, as I said, the first uh, permissions, the first request to plant out transgenic plants came in, and the um, regulatory agencies, the USDA, the EPA, and the FDA, began to um, develop their own um, capacity to oversee this regulation. And in about 1986, the coordinated framework, this was actually... Um, a large federal register document that spelled out what agency would oversee what kind of transgenic plant or organism in environmental applications came into, um, came into um, existence and divided up responsibility amongst the agencies. Now that is what obtains today. The, and I will come back to this in, in discussion times, but that's basically an overview of what's happening today. Now, this is taken directly from the website of the USDA, and this is, these are the laws, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, um, FIFRA, which is Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, and TSCA, which you heard about yesterday, the Toxic Substances Control Act. These are the statutes under, and also the, the Plant Pest Act, which is the USDA version. These are the laws under which um, 
genetically modified organisms and applications in the environment are regulated. And here is the problem, um, and that is that some, many applications actually have to be um, examined and approved by three different agencies. This makes the regulatory, in the example I gave you, it took a couple of years to get through this process from the time they started. And it makes it extremely expensive. So that's essentially the structure today. Now, why does it matter uh, whether we actually approve and accept these techniques? It matters because, in fact, um, this is one of the most powerful and the safest technologies, I think we can say that at this point, having had as much experience as we've had, that we've ever invented. And uh, why does it matter? I think that the, the quotation from Florence von Bugu, this is a Kenyan woman who tells the story that her mother sold the only cow that she owned so that Florence could go to school. She went on to get a PhD and do uh, graduate work, in, uh, postdoctoral work in the, U uh, in the UK and in the US. And then she went to Monsanto to develop a virus-resistant sweet potato. Now that virus-resistant sweet potato is not yet in production, but when it and when it, it is finally released, I think it will make a, a large difference. And, and this is a quote from one of her speeches, which I find says about all there is to say. And I finished on time. <laughs> I will certainly take questions, and I'm sure that there will be lots of things, because I was very superficial on many of the things I said in the discussion period. If she started, it probably won't stop. <laughs> um, questions both. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Are we going to change evolution by pushing more genes on, into our environment? Um, the genes that are introduced, usually, remember I, I said that there were many tens of thousands of genes. When we do a wide cross, we move half of the genes from one organism to another. Now, people have suggested that species barriers have never been crossed, and that isn't even true. Wheat itself, as I'm going to get, get a field trip to where wheat originated, but it's an interspecific hybrid. I gave you an, an example of a bacterium that moves DNA from itself into a, bac into a plant cell. So this is not a new problem. Hybrid corn has had the potential Corn plants themselves, now, there are parts of the world in which teosinte grows where corn and teosinte actually interbreed. That creates gene flow, as it were. But I think what you have to be aware of is that wild plants and cultivated plants are very different. Cultivated plants depend on people to plant them. Otherwise, the entire earth would be covered with either rice or or maize or wheat, you know, those are the three big crops. That doesn't happen largely because we've incapacitated agricultural plants uh, in their reproductive capacity. Now that doesn't mean that genes never go from cultivated plants to wild plants. It means that they don't survive. The old farmers in, in uh, Central America knew when it was time to go back and replant maize because the hybrids had stopped coming up. Um, now, Today, we have better ways of monitoring whether a gene goes from a crop plant to a weed. If there are no closely related weeds, it won't go anywhere because there are, there are pollination barriers, okay? Wheat or corn pollen on a cabbage plant doesn't make a corn-cabbage hybrid. Um, but there are plants, so, so it's very crop specific. It depends on what part of the world. There are parts of the world where there are wild maize plants. There are mu much of the area where maize is grown, it's in, there are no wild plants. Rapeseed is a particularly important one because it has wild relatives. Having said that, 
the efforts to detect the flow of even something as, as obvious as herbicide resistance from wild plants to weeds have not yielded much. You can do it in the laboratory, but it doesn't happen much in nature. So those early concerns have turned out to be not as serious as people originally feared. And then the other thing you have to do is always look at what it is that you're transferring and what, when does it matter. If you transfer a gene from herbicide resistant plant, uh, crop plant to a weed, you have a weed problem, but only where, you have to, where you're trying to spray that, er that particular herbicide. This is not, an, again, let me, let me point out to you, this is not a new problem. Herbicide resistance can be, uh, can be created by, by standard mutagenesis techniques. So these are all not new problems. There isn't a single issue that has been raised that is a new issue that is unique to using these particular techniques. Yes? Um, <coughs> the perception of risk, um, uh, it's very hard for me to answer this in a blanket way. We have not had the, um, the kind of intense anti-GMO activity that we have seen in Europe on the part of certain organizations. Um, and that's simply because it's at a lower level. When you go in, as I have done in the last few years, especially since the publication of my, my book in uh, last October, I talked to lots and lots of people. And I think that the issues that people raise in the U.S. are not different from the issues that they raise. What I generally find is that any given individual has one particular thing he or she is worried about. And they're slightly different. There's a... Um, in, in Europe, very often there is, a, um, and this is true in the U.S. as well, people, what, what has been done by plant breeders to make plants, plant products such as tomatoes and fruits more distributable, shippable, tends to make them less flavorful. People confuse that issue, food quality, with these kinds of genetic modifications, and that's a very common complaint, oh, the, they're making, they're going to make everything taste bad. And in fact, those are all, those, those kinds of issues come up in, in every country. So I, I think that the big difference is that we simply haven't had the level of um, fomentation of the anti-GMO sen sentiment. But I think people have all the same concerns. And I don't know how to address them except to address them one at a time. Yes. I promise. Isn't it on the local level the US now is more involved concerning GMO? And that and how does this relate to the view of the major food companies and the process of regulation when there is more uncertainty actually on the relation to the board dimension? So there's a basic stress happening there. I think it's, it's very difficult to generalize. So just to take a subset of subsets, in California there were several initiatives on ballots, local ballots, um, which would have um, uh, eliminated, forbidden the planting of transgenic uh, contemporary GMOs. The places where they succeeded are places where there was absolutely no effort on the part of anyone to to inform the populace or themselves about the issues. The areas in which it was defeated, it was farmers who actually uh, drove the, the, the efforts to, to familiarize people with what the benefits and, the, and the, the upsides and the downsides and so forth are. And so it's a matter of what people, where people get, have information when they don't. Those issues are, in my own state, there are such ballots. You hear about them, but they're also very active um, uh, farmer organizations, and there are people who are distributing information. Now, will some of those initiatives succeed? I don't know. But in, a, in my state, it would be a tragedy if it happened, because, for example, um, uh, th this kind of virus is wiping out all of the plum trees 
and there are transgenic plum trees that are essentially resistant to that that can be used if people don't say, oh, well, I don't want that in my, in my county. Um, that's a big, it's a big worry, and it's a big worry for farmers because they, these are advantageous for them, they're better for the environment, and so forth. I mean, they really reduce pesticide use, depending on, obviously, you can't generalize. It depends on what crop plants you're talking about and what's grown where. Okay, all right. And get all that stuff out of the way. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I was assigned to uh, give you the Israeli perspective and talk about, can you hear me? And talk about the controversy and about the uh, lessons one can uh, take from uh, GMO controversy uh, to uh, nanotechnology. So, um, just a brief history. Um, in the beginning, there was, uh, 10 years ago, the first product, and these were two uh, types of tomatoes. They were good, they were nice. Flavor saver was um, uh, less um, accepted. I mean, uh, it was not as good product as the uh, tomato puree in, in Britain. However, in uh, 1998 and 1999, there was an outrage against GMOs uh, in Europe, and uh, Prince Charles, in his uh, article in the Daily Telegraph, uh, did not initiate it, but rather uh, spilled some oil to the, to the fire. And his arguments in the first letter were uh, quite vague, but they uh, expressed fear from the unknown. And they mentioned God and the creation, Creator uh, several times. Um, after, the, after this, uh, we know what happened in Europe, and just a uh, couple of months ago, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture in Germany uh, banned experiments uh, in her jurisdiction in, in, the, in a station, agricultural uh, ministry station, by researchers who were funded by another agencies uh, to study the safety of GM plants. So this is really an anti-intellectual, anti-scientific um, attitude. And the point I'd like to make here is that uh, Minister uh, Kunast uh, is a Green Party member. Her agenda is indeed against GMOs and she could not show I mean, by, by uh, submitting to the uh, agenda, she could not show uh, this flexibility so as to allow these uh, safety experiments to go on. So opposition uh, to plant biotechnology usually uh, split to intrinsic and extrinsic. Um, and the first ones are related to uh, ethics, religion, uh, moral. The other ones are those that relate to real harms, real uh, danger. Um, what of these, uh, which of these uh, following uh, uh, problems are relevant for the nanotechnology? So what I'd like to say is that uh, in the GM 
plant uh, controversy, we have a special case. So the first one does not exist or not to the same extent in other technologies as in GMOs. As for the extrinsic uh, uh, objections, well, the potential harm uh, to, the, to health and the environment do exist, but they will be perceived more like any other pollution, uh, a novel pollution, but like any other pollution and not like the genetic uh, modification. Uh, my prediction is that uh, the socio-economical problems will be the same. And what I'd like to argue here this morning is that the opposition to GM plants is unique because it relates to life, to creation, uh, to some fears that people have from tinkering the genetic material. It was mentioned yesterday, reproductive uh, organisms. Um, and therefore, the opposition to GM plants and maybe other GMOs uh, turned into real hostility. So we're not talking anymore about rational uh, debates or discussions, but real hostility. And uh, the challenge in uh, adopting new technologies uh, in democratic society or democratic societies is that whenever we have a broad social and cultural uh, impact, we have to uh, engage the public in the decision making. And many times, and GM plants and nanotechnology will involve uh, expertise of different kinds that do not exist in one person, and uh, specifically not in, in laymen. Um, and I'll give you uh, one message uh, before I go into uh, uh, the Israeli perspective. And this is that in the GM plant opposition, we have a very strong ideological aspect, which is not related to a rational uh, discussion. So yesterday, uh, Dr. George Gray uh, discussed the uh, risk assessment, and he and all of us assume that uh, most people are sane, which is, uh, might not be the case, but also reasonable and rational. And uh, whenever you have emotions and ideology, then we lose these, uh, uh, these grounds. So I quote here from uh, uh, Margaret Josna, uh, just to uh, illustrate to you how difficult it is even if we have strong arguments, scientifically based, scientifically sound arguments, how difficult it is to uh, convince the public, uh, even the experts. So, um, <coughs> in this respect, so I'll, I'll take one uh, example, and in this respect, uh, Nina Fedorov's uh, talk was a good, very nice introduction. Um, there was a paper published in uh, year 2000, 2003, which this reviewed 250 publications on um, environmental impact of GM plants. Uh, very thorough review, outdated now because uh, I believe that by now we have close to 1,000 publications on this subject. Yet, um, there was one conclusion that struck me. In all the debates and discussions in GM plants, we, or the opponents, somehow assume that there are the GM plants, the biotechnology, and on the other side there is, what, nature? The food is stable, never has changed over the years. And what we have to do in discussing any aspect of GM plants is think about the actual alternative. What is the alternative of GM plants? Where does our food come from? And by what means? And if you do this and do this uh, honestly, 
then the impacts of GM crops are very similar to those of traditional breeding. And I would say that this is in the vast majority of cases. I can exclude some. Uh, we should not overlook any GM event. Uh, but I'll give you an example. Uh, I'll not elaborate too much. Dr. Federoff uh, has done it before. But we can take now with the genomics, we can trace back our crop varieties and see what genetic modifications really took place in having, let's say, a modern variety of rice. This is one of them. And if one traces back the lineage of crosses and go back to the land races, all these yellow arrows, we can detect hundreds of, in the, in the eyes of the geneticists, major modifications like deletions, rearrangements, and of course many mutations that have occurred. Here we got IR64, one of the leading rice varieties in Southeast Asia. And of course, Theosintia that was mentioned before, and the tomatoes. And uh, this is true for almost any crop that we uh, grow today. So the extent of genetic modification, which can be now evaluated, can be evaluated very accurately with genomics, is tremendous with conventional breeding. So when we do the comparison, and the only alternative of GM or biotechnology is the conventional breeding, which is very uh, dramatic and very extensive at the level of the genome. Gene flow. Well, this is the canola, and it is claimed that canola can cross with uh, wild brassica. Well, this is true. And I can show you, I collect all the papers that document uh, cross hybridization between canola and uh, wild brassicas. Well, what do you think canola is? Canola is a completely artificial uh, variety. So, and, and um, gene flow among the brassicae is well documented. It doesn't occur frequently, but it does occur. And the canola that we grow today does cross-pollination with wild brassica. Okay, so um, it is not restricted only to uh, GM plants. Arrow. Well, this is interesting. Um, up until uh, the 15th century, carrot used as a, as, as a crop was white and some mutational event, which we don't know what it is, what it was, um, changed the root into orange containing lots of carotenoids, beta carotene, and alpha carotene. So um, Daucus carota is the same species that grows out in the field here, all over Europe, and the carrots in the field and the wild carrots are cross-hybridized. Now, have we ever found a wild carrot with orange root? And the answer is no, although maybe around fields we can find it. The answer is very simple. The orange root doesn't have any advantage uh, in terms of uh, natural selection for the wild variety. Therefore, it is not maintained in the wild. So the real problem, in my view, with the GMO acceptance is that there is yet no one single product which can be perceived as beneficial to the public. We, we, so most of the uh, crops are commodity crops and the trades are related to the production. And we don't grow, we don't grow, uh, I mean, we don't buy in the supermarket cotton and we don't buy in the supermarket soybean and we don't buy in the supermarket grains <coughs> of corn to notice that the price goes down. But people here in Tivolo, awesome, uh, told me recently that for transgenic soybean, they pay 30% less. That's a difference in price. So all we need is a 
Good GM product, and then again, George Gray's uh, yesterday's uh, sound science, good communication, careful risk assessment, public relations, transparency, and whatever will be outweighted in terms of public acceptance with one good product. And we have to admit that uh, many of the uh, plant scientists raised the expectations of the public, and so far, we have not been able to deliver such a product. Uh, acceptance of GM in the food uh, was different when the, when the benefit was obvious. And this is in Europe. All the cheeses are made from uh, genetically engineered uh, chemosine, from different organisms, by the way. This is accepted. And of course, medicine, and this was well documented. Anything which relates to recombinant DNA and health, uh, health benefit is uh, very welcome. No questions asked. I'll give you one example, which is very frustrating. frustrating. So this is uh, uh, UNICEF and World Health Organization uh, information about vitamin A deficiency. And the numbers are really uh, bewildering. So we talk about uh, more than two million deaths a year of children under age of six uh, from vitamin A deficiency. Now, UNICEF's strategy is to uh, distribute uh, pro-vitamin A or beta carotene pills in those areas in Southeast Asia where uh, vitamin A deficiency is very uh, prevail prevalent. Uh, well, this is not sustainable, and they spend something like $100 million a year just with this distribution. So in 1993, uh, a group of uh, people, I was among them, uh, eight or nine of us, gathered in the Rockefeller Foundation to address this problem. Um, OK, uh, this is just to show that uh, most of the problems are in uh, because pro-vitamin A, retinol, is in the eye. So many, uh, many children go blind. As a matter of fact, uh, some 500,000 a year, half of them will die uh, because of this blindness in these uh, communities. Um, so uh, most of these people um, are in areas where the staple food is rice, and rice, unlike corn and other staple food, uh, is devoid of any carotenoids, doesn't have the beta carotene, which is the pro-vitamin A. Uh, they do get some vitamin A from the other food that they Take, but as you can see, this is a small portion of the diet. So the idea was to engineer rice uh, so that the grains will contain the beta carotene, the pro vitamin A. Um, well, this is the pathway in plants which shows how beta carotene here is made in a pathway of the carotenoids. Uh, 14 years of my professional life are invested in this pathway. Um, and, and this is a basic science. This is basic science to answer the question well, how tomatoes become red, um, which means not only identify the genes behind it, and, but also the regulation, the regulatory mechanisms that make the tomatoes red. And in 1993, in that meeting in, the, in New York, uh, I didn't have the whole pictures that you see here, but I did have some of these lines which are bacteria growing on a petri dish, this is E. coli, and one of them contained beta carotene, engineered with the plant gene that we had cloned before, just cloned. I mean, this was very new at that time. So the, the tools for the genetic engineering were there. And Ingo Botricus and Peter Bayer, who were there, uh, took upon them to carry out this mission. Ingo was, at that time, one of the few people in the world who could put genes into rice, and they put three genes, including our uh, cyclase. The outcome was um, this uh, golden rice, so-called, uh, rice that contained 1.6 microgram per gram dry weight beta carotene. Great achievement, however, and I quote Greenpeace, not that I want to pick on them, actually I want to pick on them, but, uh, but uh, the, the point I, I'd like to make here is not to only, not only to promote the GM, but to, to illustrate to you how 
ideological standpoint interferes with rational and reasonable decision making. Because Greenpeace um, uh, rightfully uh, deserves uh, a lot of respect for achievement in uh, protection of the environment, including here in Israel. But what they claim here is only related to health. Why an environmental organization spending so much money, also in the public relations, uh, to discredit the health benefit of golden rice? Anyway, they say that 3.7 kilograms of uncooked rice, which is 7 kilos of cooked rice, must be eaten by a person in order to alleviate vitamin A deficiency. A very respectable and uh, one of the top people in uh, nutrition of carotenoids, Robert Russell, from one of the best schools in nutrition, Tufts University in, in Boston, uh, calculated that it needs only 200 grams, uh, which will not make the uh, uh, required daily intake, intake or required daily allowance, uh, but will be enough to alleviate vitamin A deficiency syndrome. Anyway, the Guardian, they, pick, they, they took this information and the whole article, and I bring the, just the highlights. People will have to eat 3.7 kilograms uncooked rice. The rice development has provided a powerful propaganda tool for the GM industry. And this is by a, a, a correspondent on environmental <coughs> issues. Again, why an environmental correspondent will use in, a, in the article just the health arguments if he was not ideologically against GM plants and wanted to discredit um, uh, golden rice. BBC just uh, recently, um, again, same story, I'll not repeat it, you can read it. Uh, BBC, well, here there is a little bit of politics also. So there is insinuation, you know, if the efforts against, I mean, the efforts towards fighting the, uh, against terrorism would be, I mean, the, the, the energy would, and resources will be given uh, to fight hunger in other means, we will not need this uh, GM technology. Okay, in the meantime, um, golden rice was bred into local varieties by local breeders in Vietnam and other places, especially in the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines. Uh, this, is, this picture is from a few months ago. Well, um, we, we have to wait for deregulation. They, they cannot grow it. But this is to show that it can be transferred into local varieties. Two weeks ago, in the, uh, in the, in the journal uh, Nature Biotechnology, appeared uh, Golden Rice 2. Uh, the small change, they used a different gene here from a different source. Anyway, uh, this time, Golden Rice contains 36 microgram per gram uh, per dry weight. This is 23-fold more than Golden Rice. And um, now, even according to Greenpeace, all you need to eat is uh, half a portion of your rice per day in order to alleviate, to get the whole uh, RDA amount. We need to wait for deregulation. Um, this statistics is uh, given by reliable uh, sources. 6,000 children die every day as we are waiting for deregulation that might take up to uh, well, several years. Why does Greenpeace combat golden rice? Golden rice is the first GM plant with, uh, with visible benefit. Uh, golden rice undermines Greenpeace's socioeconomic argument. I, I don't have time to go into this, but there was a clever trick how to maintain patents and yet release the whole technology for free for Southeast Asia. Um, uh, no income from royalties uh, from farmers uh, <coughs> earning less than $10,000 a year, which is <coughs> practically all farmers. 
Golden rice is a tie-breaking GM plant. That's my view of it. And I think that once it is accepted, grown, shows the benefit, uh, it will change public opinion also in uh, developed countries. I'd like to uh, go over the Israeli perspective. This is the website of Greenpeace Israel. It's exactly like uh, Greenpeace uh, International, except that the hand grenade here is on the right and in the international is on the left. Namely, they translate everything into Hebrew. They are against GMOs. They are not very active. Uh, they do, uh, once in a while, they, they speak out. Megamai Ruka, a green approach on campuses by students, very active, very focused on issues, uh, a little bit naive uh, against GM plants. Uh, I meet uh, one group of them uh, next week. Um, they are not very active, though, against GM plants. Green action, eco-sociological, uh, eco-social change, Peula uh, is very active, uh, very much against GM plants. The motivation is the socio-economical uh, point of view. Uh, the GMO is only in Hebrew, so uh, for those of you who uh, cannot read Hebrew, just look at the label that they produced. Uh, it shows everything. So this is, uh, these are the groups who are active in the field. There are, there are other smaller. So why is that? Well, you know, we have in Israel other existential problems. Um, and once the disengagement will proceed, then once another disengagement will proceed, once we have peace, then we will have, I predict, other major problems to worry about, like who is a Jew or, you know, these kind of things. And environmental and this uh, GMO will always, always be second. This is the mentality, uh, at least my uh, perception. Now, uh, some observation about the Israeli public. I do give uh, public appearances at least once a month would be teachers, students, general public, elderly homes, whatever. And I talk about GM plants and controversy, and then there is discussions and questions and so on. Now, every time this is like Nina's uh, uh, experience, I show this uh, slide, which GM crops are grown, and you know, we have four crops, that's it. I mean, 99% of them. And two genes, that's it. Then I show this slide, who is growing GM plants, and then there's the US, Argentina, Canada, Brazil, the New World, China, let's include China in the New World. Um, and then always, without any exception, people jump and say, hey, what about Israel? I say, well, we don't grow in Israel GM plants. We do not grow GM plants in Israel for practical reasons. We export to Europe, we don't want any contamination, and we don't grow GM plants. Say, no. I mean, they argue with me. You can't be right. So how do you explain the tomato? It's the same experience as this. So what do I take from this? People here think that they eat GM food, and they don't worry. They don't cry. That's my take from it. Uh, let's go uh, briefly about the regulation in Israel that only two ministries, Ministry of Agri Agriculture, which, which is most uh, active, and Ministry of Health. Uh, Ministry of Agriculture had uh, established in 1991 the National Committee for Transgenic Plants uh, and the Ministry of Health through a Functional Committee of Novel Foods. The regulations in the Ministry of uh, Agriculture are uh, derived from two laws, plant protection law and seed law, and the seed regulations which uh, relate to transgenic plants uh, went into effect a few months ago, and Dr. Edna Levy, who is here at IMOs, the secretary, uh, Edna Levy, is the chairperson of this uh, committee uh, leading this activity. Uh, the committee has eight, eight out of 13 uh, members are uh, public rep representatives, including uh, Green Movement. We have to uh, ask for license for experiment. Um, 
show location, containment, monitoring, etc. There are only uh, in 19, in 19, sorry, in 20, 2004, there were, I'm, I'm about, just about finished, uh, we had only nine field experiments or field tests on an area which is less than 10 acres, and they are all in the website. Um, the issue now in Israel is labeling. Um, Ministry of Health, through the Committee for Novel Foods, uh, leads a uh, move to label GM food, and this is their statement. You can look at the website and see more. Uh, Ministry of uh, Industry, Trade and Labor, however, which is a uh, member of this uh, committee for, label, for uh, novel foods, is against it. And Minister Olmert believes that uh, since in spite of worldwide tests and research, there is no apparent evidence for health hazard, therefore he uh, doesn't want to label. Obviously, there is an American influence here, about pressure. Uh, but we have to admit that our mentality, I mean public mentality at the moment, tends to be more American than European in many other things, and uh, this is included. Um, Knesset, you have here uh, uh, views of uh, members of the Knesset, and they are for labeling, and uh, I don't have to go into uh, uh, more details. I don't have time to go into more details. Uh, politicians, this is, I, I had to, to uh, show this. Uh, we, we shouldn't expect much of, uh, of uh, our government. So, Benjamin Netanyahu, just three weeks ago, uh, in, a, in a hallucinated press conference, predicted that Israel would be one of the ten richest countries based on GNP per capita. So, um, in Tel Aviv University, Professor Shmuel Kandel found out that the data was, was wrong and the calculation was completely wrong. And in an interview with the arts, he, he was asked about it. Uh, you know, said Shmuel uh, uh, Kandel from uh, Tel Aviv University calculated, said that you are wrong. So Netanyahu said, if he is so clever, why is he a professor? How come he is not rich? So this is the attitude. <laughs> it, it, you know, Crown, Crown Priest Netanyahu said it um, without any hesitation. He is proud of it, I guess. So this is the attitude that we have. Um, this is my last slide. And this is not for the nanotechnology. Look, with the GM, or recombinant DNA. The, the crucial point was in the 70s. This was the time that the fear from recombinant DNA was at its peak. We all remember Jeremy Rifkin in courts, um, etc. And if there is a lesson to learn how to uh, manage uh, controversial technology, uh, technologies, I think that more than GM plants, which is not so successful, I would look into the recombinant DNA and how it was eventually uh, prevailed over all uh, uh, problems. Thank you. Uh, uh, well, if, if, we, uh, if you want it short, both of us should go out to the grass and finish it there. Um, 
It will be short, he will knock me down. <laughs> Look at it. Scientists, nanotechnologists, I don't know them, but GM plant people, they do have values, they do have ideologies. But science doesn't have ideology. Science doesn't have a morale. So if we dealing, if we're discussing the issue and we would like to do it in a rational manner, then we have to take off our ideology. And what I wanted to say here, and maybe not did it uh, not so well, and uh, maybe a little bit too bold, is that in dealing with an issue, if you if you cover yourself with your ideology, you, you cannot uh, do it properly. So, in other words, um, you know, if, if if I talk to an environmentalist and suddenly he talks about the health benefits of GM plants. No, I don't know exactly what his position is, and I don't think that I, we can talk reasonably about the environment. I talk to a nutritionist against, who is against the implant, and then he talks about the socio-economical adverse effects you know, on the poor in Asia. I know exactly that his, uh, what, what his stance is, and I know that I cannot have a reasonable, rational discussion on an issue. <coughs> See, that's what I meant. Maybe I didn't do it uh, clearly. Try me when you have time. <laughs> See that I'll have another uh, role as a moderator outside on the grass. Um, now here I'm going to... You'll have to correct me, so am I pronouncing your name correctly? Is it Mikhail Kordas? Yes. Mikhail Kordas. And now the second one is, um, Professor Kordas is a professor of philosophy and chair of the Department of Applied Philosoph Philosophy at the Wageningen? Wageningen, I almost did it correctly, University in the Netherlands. Uh, among other things, he's written 11 books and, um, and is, uh, works a lot on bioethics of food, so please. between these two standpoints. Let me show you the structure of my talk. I will first say something about the main issues in the debate in Europe on biotech crops. Then I will take a more distant stance and will try to say something from an ethical standpoint on these problems. I will present some ethical perspectives, the utilitarian, the deontological, and a deliberative approach, an approach which stress deliberation and consultation. I will apply the approach, I will show what kind of problems res uh, resist these approaches and what not, and I will say something about the future of biotech. Examples of crops, we have already heard a lot about this, this morning, so I'll skip this very, early, very quickly. It started in, in Europe, at least, is with the herbicide resistance, but nowadays there are lots of other crops, more than 100 at least, in all over the world. These were the issues in the debate, more or less in a chronological uh, sequence. It started with metaphysical arguments or religious arguments. We have already seen this in the slide of uh, Professor Heesberg. Uh, Prince Charles uh, mingled, uh, started uh, mixed in the debate with uh, playing gods. Uh, then came uh, especially Greenpeace with the idea that there were environmental risk of GM crops. This is an important thing and thanks to Greenpeace, in Europe at least, we got attention to the environmental risks. Because the European Union started a health expert commission in the 90s on the risk of crops, but it was only concerned with the health risk. So experts 
they made, you could say, a one-sided decision only to look for the health risk with respect to the GM crops and not to the environmental risks. So it's thanks to the non-experts, to the non-scientists, that new risks were identified. And I guess we have to take that into account with risk analysis. Labeling and separation became a main issue uh, because uh, the European public in general thinks that even if people have lousy arguments, have bad arguments, they have a right for those lies, lousy arguments. This is a genuine democratic right to have your own arguments. And someone can call it lousy. Who is that one? And someone can call it a good argument. But it's up to the public to make it out what is a good argument and what not. And you cannot a priori in advance say that is a lousy argument or that's emotional. We have heard lots of scientists doing an enormous amount of emotional things. I have heard this morning of some scientists who said that biotechnology, GM, is absolutely safe. Well, it's only a technology that exists for 15 years. And if you look to the history of lots of technology, 50 years is much too early to say that it's safe. I'm not saying that it is not safe. I'm only saying it's much too early. So scientists also are very emotional on this debate. So we should be very careful with these labels of emotional, the emotional public on the one hand, and the rational scientist on the other hand. So labeling is a sign of respect, respect for the dissidents. The, residents, the resist, resistance spiral is a very technical problem. I will not go too much in that uh, because I do not have much time. GM food for the developing world was also an issue because indeed is it the case that the hungry do not have a right to decide on the quality of their own food. When you're hungry, do you only have to digest what other gives you, or do you have some right to decide about the quality of your food? We have seen this quotation of Florence Van Gogh, and I think it's, it's not very respectful what she is saying about the hungry. So then there was this issue of the method of risk assessment. This is also a rather technological issue. It's about do we only, only test the changed protein? as was the case for long in the United States, or do we test the whole organism with this change protein in it, which is the regular risk assessment procedure in Europe, and it's called the Monte Carlo system. So this is also a technical issue where lots of values are connected inside science. Intellectual property, I guess that is one of the most important issues with respect to GM. All the risks are, in my view, not, it, and now I'm speaking from a personal point of view, I thank you, from a personal point of view, all these risks, as far as I can see and as, I, as far as I can make up my mind out of the uh, stories of the, ex the experts, risk is, is not that big an issue. Intellectual property, that's really the problem, the patenting. Who owns the patents? Who, win, who, who has the profit? Who are the losers? That's the most important thing. And that's also this last argument. So what happens with the small farmers? What happens with the biotechnology divide? Will there become a larger divide, a divide between poor and rich in the world? So these were some of the main uh, issues that went around with respect to GM. They were not all directly connected to GM, for example, the patenting or the social arguments, but at least there were, people had some reason to talk on these things with respect to GM. There is, as said, this radical division, citizen groups on the one hand and scientists on the other hand. And as said, I guess it is not, if you want to, as a scientist, if you want to get support of the public, which is a rather democratic thing, I guess. If it is essentially to get the support of the public, I guess it's not very reasonable and it's not very respectful to say that the public is only emotional, has only fears, is only hostile, is afraid to hear the truth and only wants to hear big lies. I guess that's not, not the way you should convince the public. You should do some other communication strategy. So my point of view is, Let's look to ethics, and maybe ethics can help you to find a middle, to find a coexistence of the different point of views. And maybe that can help you in peacefully regulating this battle on GM food or not. I'm sorry. 
So this is my scheme, an ethical scheme, how to solve an ethical problem. So the main ethical problem is, should we, should we, so is it ethical acceptable to introduce GM food, GM crops for food? That's the main ethical problem. And with my students, I discuss these problems with this five-step scheme. Um, I will go first now into the first step, which is, what is the problem? What are the stakeholders? And you see here at the left, higher left side, the practice of the stakeholders. At the right side, the food and farming styles and the consumers. I have some organizational principles like market, state and civil society. As, a, as maybe you know, in democratic societies, you can choose. Do you want to regulate something by market forces? Do you want to choose this on vol voluntary basis, civil society? Do you want to regulate it by state? And then I have some on the ethical and the legal discourses. So filled in with respect to GM food in the international context, it is very clear that GM, the main stakeholders, are large corporations. And this is also uh, uh, connected with the fact that many public companies, many public organizations like universities, research labs, have to work together nowadays with the uh, private companies. It has to, this is a very strange thing, you could say. This is one of the main issues, I guess, of the biotech. 30 years ago, all life science research was done, or let's say 9-10% of the life science reader research was done in public research institutions, in universities and so on. Nowadays, it's the reverse. 9 tenths of all the research in the life science is done in private companies, which, is, which gives you... I'm not saying it's worrying, I'm only saying this gives new ethical and political problems. Because as we all know, <laughs> private companies, they want a lot of secrecy, they want to restrict access to their bio data banks, to their research uh, data, because of competition and so on. So there is a big problem of the openness of science and in how far science is really an open institution anymore. So that's one of the main things with respect to this uh, box on the left side. On the right side, you see I have made a, a distinction between two very, let's say, general food styles. On the one hand, there are these cultures and these people, peoples that live for food. Italian culture is very important. French, the Japanese, food is an important thing in their lives. And there are these cultures where food is not very important where food is only a kind of fuel. And probably it's not without reason that in the United States, genetic modified food is indeed uh, valued so much, and in Europe not. It has something to do also with the appreciation of food. And in far you like the quality of the food, so it's not only the taste, but it's also the social associations that you have with food. That food is a social thing, it's a meal. It is eating together. Okay, let me go to one of the problems, one of the main uh, issues, that is this new private-public constellations. I've already said a little about it. The private-public constellation in the life sciences is huge. So in Europe, for example, um, um, most um, grants of the European Union, you only get it when it is matched for 50% by private uh, companies. So in Europe, private-public constellations are also encouraged very much. But it means that we have all kinds of problems with the secrecy and the, info, the access of the data banks, which in a certain sense causes lots of distrust also from the public. So the reliability of science is at stake. There is a general distrust of biotechnology because so much money is going on. And we all know that who pays, who determines. So the public has some reason, I guess, to, say, to be worried about this whole thing. Biopiracy is one of the other things, that one of the consequences of these kind of things. Now, let me go into what I call the third step of my scheme. This is the step which is the core business of ethics. In ethics, we have at least three large perspectives. The first perspective says, look to the consequences. And when the consequences are okay, we can introduce the GM crops. So the greatest happiness of the greatest number, if we can realize this, with GM crops, no problem. So the consequences must be good. And how do we know that the consequences is good? Because science can give us a good cost-benefit analysis. So you see, the utilitarian approach is stressing 
the fact that the costs can be monetized, can get a money tag, and it means that if the balance is in favor of the benefits, so you can earn a lot of money with the GM crop, you should do it. And it, but if the balance is in favor of the cost, you shouldn't do it. Now, this is a very short course, as a matter of fact, a very superficial course in ethics. But the main problems, let me immediately go over to the main problems of the utilitarian position is always, are there no principal rights at all? Is it not the case that we do things and we value things, rights, without taking the cost into account? Think about the right to have a work day of eight hours or ten hours. I guess in the European Union it's now 42 hours a week. This is a right. And probably it costs an enormous amount of money. It would be much more effective to let people work 60 hours a day. Or 80 hours maybe. Or even children let them work. So cost-benefit analysis has absolutely its limits with respect to rights of people. Think about another thing. Informed consent. This is now the main issue in medical sciences, informed consent. It means that uh, if you do an experiment with a medicine, you have to ask the people. And many say no, many patients say no. So this is, makes the cost of medicine enormously high. But we think that from a democratic society, rights are more important, and in this, time, this case, the right of informed consent is more important than the cost. Because there is more in life than costs. There is more in life than money. Many things have an infinitive value, like having a good meal, for example. You can pay a lot on a meal, but in the, in the end, the meal can be very bad. So there are some limits to this utilitarian approach. I'm not saying that it is a bad approach, I'm not saying that it is not good, but it, just has, it has its limits. So the respect for rights, the respect for rights of minority especially, are really at stake in the utilitarian approach. And the integrity of plants, well, you cannot put a money tag on the integrity of plants. But is it, a, is it an issue, integrity of plants? I'm, I I'm don't know, but I have seen many of my colleagues, which are rather reasonable persons, that say that integrity is a problem. I do not agree with them, but that's another thing. I'm not saying that they're stupid, I'm not saying that they're emotional. The second large philosophical, ethical approach is saying, Rights, that's the main thing. Rights are the main stuff in ethics. So look, what are the values? What are the rights? And respects for rights are an important thing. And in that thing, the right of access to food is one of the main things. But also, and I can show you, I hope it's here. There is, according to the United Nations, even not only a right to sufficient food, not only a right to affordable food, but the right to adequate food. The right to have the food according to your culture. So this is a long story, but it says, the Committee of the United Nations, the Human Rights Committee, says that the availability of food in a quantity and quality is sufficient to satisfy the dietary needs of individuals, so that's the nutrition component, free from adverse substance, so no contaminations, food safety, and acceptable within a given culture. So it's saying people have the right choose their own food styles. So, connected with GM, if you want non-GM, be it what your arguments are, you have at first instance to respect this right, as long as you don't harm, as a matter of fact, other people. But it has the same thing with respect to GM. So people have also a right for GM food. It works both ways, as, as a matter of fact. So labeling is a way of respecting rights of people. So this is, let's say, the main approach, the main, di uh, the main um, uh, con uh, effect, you could say, of the deontological perspective. So you have a right for food, even if it's for food choice, for your own food choice, even if it is unhealthy. Now, let me present you the third approach. It's what is called a deliberative approach, communicative approach. And in a certain sense, in Europe, in the European Union, in all the countries in Europe, this deliberative approach is practiced. So it's not my own approach in a certain sense. Because it, it, has, it, it, it starts with the idea, let's deliberate. What are our own ethical uh, intuitions? 
without saying that the one is naive or the other believes lies and so on. Just be neutral with respect to that. Communicate on, com on your ethical intuitions with respect to GM food. What do you think about these benefits? What do you think about these technologies? And we need good expert advice, as a matter of fact. What are the risks? Do you think they're worthwhile? That's the way the things are happening now in the, in the European Union, and the whole deliberation process is put in the, into the European Constitution. So the general food law, Article 7, 8, and 9, are all about the need to consult the public with respect to technological innovations. And I guess this deliberative perspective can integrate utilitarian approach, the cost-benefit analysis, and the deontological approach, so the respect for rights. Now let's go to these, uh, to these uh, issues in the debate uh, that I first made the list of. Can we handle all these uh, issues with these different perspectives? Let's uh, look the fourth step, as I call it, with respect to the decision. As a matter of fact, the GM, uh, the utilitarian approach, which stresses so much the consequences, the good consequences of GM, it looks to the safety and it says, well, science should do the based risk assessment. The ontological position would say, let's label the food, right on adequate food is an important thing, and if some sector in society, some groups in society want GM, that's okay, but you should respect also the non-GM people. So labeling is something out of respect for the democratic citizenship that are there. The deliberative position would say, well, let's do some consultations. Let's talk with the main stakeholders. Let's talk with the NGOs. What are their, what are their main concerns with respect? Can we meet somewhere? Can we find a decision? I already did this. Managing by deliberation would mean, let's look to a peaceful coexistence of food styles and lifestyles. Let's look to a peaceful coexistence between GM and non-GM. And let's do sign some work. We already know that for GM, sometimes you need a large area. You need also for, let's say, biological or organic food, organic farming in a large area. What, what must be the, the refugees between the two areas? How, how to, not to have gene flow? So these kind of uh, research issues become then necessary. And in the consultations, it will become then important who participates, who is there, what is the agenda, what kind of topics do we discuss, what kind of new information get we? Do we have integral ex experts that really say the objective things that are there, that are not paid by some unclear force behind them? And the output is also very important with respect to the consultation, because what happens with the output, when we have had the consultation for several weeks, when citizens, consumers, stakeholders have indeed uh, intensely discussed, will this happen something with this output in policy making, in governments, and so on. So these kind of things are very important. Now let's look to the problems. I guess the environmental risks and uh, the, the reasonable um, meeting, uh, how do you say, the, the reasonable uh, taking into account of lay perceptions of risk can done by these consultation methods. Method of risk assessment also, they can be uh, considered. Labeling is a main thing, I guess, you can discuss in the consultation. GM for the, labor, for the, for the developing world, I would also say, why do hungry people have to shut their mouths about the quality of the food? That's not fair. They should also have a right to choose their own food. And they do. Many people, if you, give, if you go to Islam people and give them pork meat, they will not eat it, even if they're very hungry. And it's the same in India, if they give you meat, they will not eat it if they're a vegetarian. So people have a right to choose the quality of their food. Social desirability of the GM technologies, I guess it's a very important thing. So what kind of future world do we want? Do we really indeed have a future world where the food is only seen as fuel? Or do we need a future world where food has more qualities, really social qualities, that enhance the quality of our life? I'm not saying that GM reduces our food to fuel. Be careful. So the fifth step is, I guess, also very important. Suppose we indeed introduce GM. What is the aftercare? Is there a monitoring system nowadays on GM crops? As far as I know, there is no monitoring system. 
So I guess it would be very necessary to take into account the risks and what happens with these risks. Because we know 15 years of no evidence of risk doesn't mean that there are no risks at all. Think about the history of medicine. Think about the history of radiation. Radiation was used in the 20s for 15 years, for 10, 10 years, for nearly everything. With horrible things, horrible consequences, as a matter of fact. But people said that there were no absolutely deadly risks. And nowadays we don't use radiation as a medicine anymore, not that much anymore. So cost, but cost effectiveness, as a matter of fact, is also a, a main issue. But I guess the most important issue is the accountability. What do we do with the biotechnology defined? What do we do if indeed the GM nations will become very rich, and the, the non-GM nations will become very, very poor? Do we want this? Do we want to live in a world where there is a, such a large gap between poor and rich people? Uh, there are some uh, unresolved problems nowadays, also from my approach, seen from the consultation and the deliberative ethics. The resistance spiral is thing, is thing, still a thing to worry. And I guess a lot of scientists have to work about that we decrease this, the resistance of the, of the bacteria, the pests, and so on. Intellectual property is also a main issue. I will not say uh, uh, something about it because it, it, it's, very, it's very complicated. But I guess uh, promising are things like benefit sharing. Is it possible to share the royalties of your patent with the people that in the end we're producing the, the sources of your product? It, the farmers, in this case, mostly. Is it possible to share benefits of these technologies? Some research institutions, some international institutions, but also some companies are doing good work in this. So I guess the social aspects are also very important. This is what I call the biotechnology divide. So what will be the future? I guess the future will not be that we have Frankenstein. The future will not be the magic bullet. Golden rice is not yet on the market, and it will not be a magic bullet. There are all, all kinds of other alternatives, of alternatives for golden rice. For example, uh, uh, giving um, uh, farmers uh, fruit and vegetable seeds. So there are all kinds of, of, of possibilities. But what I'm pleading for is that we try to, as democratic societies, we try to develop not only technology, but also our normative intuitions, our normative values. Because what is clear with biotech, that it poses indeed new ethical problems. Patenting, private public companies, the way we go on, we, 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 we have our relationship with nature. So there is a need for a global framework, especially for monitoring the risks, like we do, for example, with medicine. We should have the same kind of thing with respect to, uh, to uh, GM crops, I guess. There is a need for a public participation, public participation models on all levels, on global, on the local, and on the national. Because, as, it's, as I said, it's no use in a democratic society when scientists say that the public is only stupid. You will not convince them in this way. So we need also, and that's my last point, we need lots of biotech benefit sharing. We need models that can help the underdeveloped or the developing world in sharing with this knowledge and this technology and find out what aspects of this technology they want to do. Well, here are some more new uh, moral problems. Um, but the first, this is always what I discuss with my students. In how far have people indeed a right to adequate food? So food according to their own food choices, independent of their consequences. And, the, and this is also a very interesting issue. Suppose one nation indeed becomes very wealthy by investing in biotech. What will happen when other nations become poor? Is there a duty to exist? And then the last question, can indeed golden rice eradicate vitamin A deficiency? Are there no alternatives? Fruits and vegetables? What do people in the cities, can they have fruits and vegetables? Well, this is a problem. Okay, thank you. Patenting is, is really the, 
as far as I can see now, after 20. Yeah, but before the 80s, it was impossible to patent those, those things. You had farmers' rights. There were farmers' rights, for, for example, in Europe. A farmer, when he had developed a, a, a certain uh, a, a breeding, um, a certain rice or a certain certain crop, he could uh, announce this on the on the market of breeders, and then it was respected. But it was not a patent thing. Nowadays, since this law in the United States, in, what was it, 82, Bale Doyle Act, what? Yeah, that's it is a Plant Protection Act, but the Bale Doyle Act is from '82, and since that time, it's allowed to patent genes or gene sequences and methods to to uh, to isolate them. Uh, there, there are here, I guess, enormous difference between Europe, European patent policies, and the American policies. But in general, I'm not against patenting. So I'm looking for mechanisms mechanisms to to um, to improve the patent system. Uh, that uh, that it does not uh, contribute to this uh, biotechnology divide. So one of the mechanisms is benefit sharing. It means that when, for example, you start with a, a crop, with improving a crop, w w which happens nowadays in the potato uh, sector, um, the Dutch potato br uh, gr uh, breeders they improve potatoes, uh, for example, pesticide resistant they are by infusing them with genes from potatoes in the Andes, in uh, Latin America. Now, these potatoes in Latin America, as a matter of fact, are produced and are bred, are a lifelong work, generations-long work of farmers over there. So what they try to do is to, benefit, to share their benefits of improving these genetically modified potatoes with the farmers that have produced these, um, these, uh, these uh, wild variants, of, or what we call wild variants of potato. So I guess um, benefit sharing with respect to patenting is one possibility to, to let's say, to, to, to get the sharp edges of this patenting system. And another thing is that the patent should be very careful and should be not too broad, because mostly in the American, in the American patenting court, the patents are very broad. So the, there are these two, pa two genes of uh, uh, breast cancer, um, the BRA1, the BRA R, and the BRA2, and uh, Myriad has, uh, has the patents on it. It means that uh, if you have breast cancer and you need the therapy, you have to pay these royalties. And they are very broad royalties. And I guess it's better to make them, to narrow them down and only on a certain <coughs> aspect of the G. I hope I have answered your question. I'm sorry, but I think this is warming up. But if I don't sit down, you will never have your lunch. So, thank you very much. Thank you. of GM, um, we've heard about various types of genetically modified foods, we've heard about legal, ethical, social, environmental um, issues. What I'd like to do now is to invite the respondents to come sit on the podium, as well as our speakers. Um, I have to uh, say, please come, uh, Tamar Dayan and all, all the rest of you, please do. Um, I'm going to be very cruel, and, um, and when seven minutes come, I'm just going to cut you off, so please... Please help me, and uh, I'd also like to ask our speakers to come sit up here, and uh, if you're all there with us, perhaps we'll have a bit more time for questions at the end. Please. Thank you. So, um, I think I'll introduce all the speakers together now, and then to ask them one by one to start talking. Um, so we have here a panel, and I, I don't want to use just one adjective, but we have uh, zoologists, historians, philosophers, lawyers, and physicians here with us, and each and every one of you can take whichever title they think is appropriate. Uh, our first speaker will be Professor Tamar Dayan from the Faculty of Life Sciences and the Department of Zoology at Tel Aviv University. Uh, then we will have Professor Liu Khoury, um, Director of the Cohn Institute for History and Philosophy of Science and Ideas, again at Tel Aviv University. We also have, and I never know how to do this, is it Advocate, Doctor or Doctor Advocate uh, Do Khenin uh, from the Environmental and Justice Program of the Porter School of Environmental Studies, also of the Law School. And we also have with us Dr. Othniel Dror, uh, who's head of the History of Medicine section in the Medical Faculty of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. So please, uh, Professor Dayan. Okay. Is this work? Okay. 
Well, as the token ecologist or conservation biologist and, yes, a de zoologist, I'd like to make a few comments that relate only to the ecological aspects of this issue. And I'd like to start with a few things that I think almost everyone can agree about. First, that functioning ecosystems are our life support system. Two, that they're very, very complex, so our predictive ability, even with very sophisticated models, is low. The third is that natural ecosystems have been very seriously and very hard hit in recent uh, uh, decades, and that many agricultural crops have relatives, wild relatives, some weedy relatives, and that there are is gene transfer with these relatives that forms hybrids, many of which are sterile, many of which are not viable, but some, there are rare occurrences. And I should continue, Adi, you asked an excellent evolutionary question. So the whole history of evolution of life on Earth is the history of improbable and rare events, which is one of the arguments by creation scientists. Is this couldn't have happened by evolution. It's unlikely, it's too rare. So we know, or we believe, most of us, that it has happened by evolution, and that rare events are very important. And another point that I think is no longer controversial is that containment measures, especially in the field, are not foolproof. And this would be also the argument in a National Research Council in the US report about uh, genetically modified organisms. So we have to realize that there will be mistakes in handling and with pollination and seed transfer and abuse and erroneous handling and carelessness or whatever genes do and will move around. Now, Dr. Ausman made an incredibly important point yesterday by pointing out that when dealing with genetically modified organisms, we're dealing with self-reproducing systems, so we might expect a great consequence of minor releases. And this is a key point to remember. And another point is that because genes move around, be unlike most agricultural practices, here we're t talking about technologies that will probably be irreversible once they're practiced at a large scale. Now, ecologists on the whole see the advantages, and I think Dr. Fedov pointed out a very important advantage of potential advantage of the genetic genetically modified organisms. But there are also concerns, and they have been put together by the Ecological Society of America and published now in ecological applications in the recent uh, uh, journal, and those are creating new or more vigorous pests and pathogens, exacerbating the effects of existing pests through hybridization with related transgenic organisms, harm to non-target species such as soil organisms and non-pest insects, etc., disruption of biotic communities, including agro-ecosystems, which are of major ecological concern today, and I will point out here that the Old World, the European Union, has the opposite uh, approach of trying to do agri-environment schemes that are both environmentally friendly and biodiversity friendly. And irreparable loss or changes in species diversity or genetic diversity within species. And to this lid, I would ask the unexpected outcomes, because when you're dealing with very complex systems, which ecosystems are, you can pretty much expect the unexpected. Um, the emotional issues were emphasized for some reason, so I'd like to say that this is based on hard science. Well, as far as biology is a hard science. It's invasion biology, which is a fast-growing field of research. Invasions of alien invasive species are probably the number two cause now for loss of biodiversity worldwide. They're a huge economic load on the world. In the US, they're estimated at $137 billion a year. And chances of species turning invasive are incredibly low. No more than one in a hundred, maybe one in a thousand species will turn invasive. And yet these very rare invasives have a very serious impact on the world's environments. And this is pretty much the worry of ecologists because most genetically modified organisms are going to be entirely benign ecologically and environmentally. The worry is that the more cases there are, the more organisms, the more modifications, the more locations, the rare events will occur. That will be a problem. And we're talking here about genes that confer an advantage, like for drought or for pesticide or herbicide resistance. So they have a chance. This is not uh, orange, cor uh, orange um, carrots, this, these are genes that confer an advantage. 
Uh, the worries are based on evolutionary research and the idea and the understanding the key innovations in taxa have shaped the evolution of life on Earth. Are we adding key innovations? Are we doing so at a rate that's unprecedented? Uh, it's true that there have been crosses, intraspecific crosses, interspecific crosses. Here we're talking about transferring genes among kingdoms. This is a very major test, uh, step. And of course, our understanding of dispersal and biogeography. I'd like to end with several comments on last evening's uh, um, presentations. First, the precautionary principle is the basis of modern conservation biology, is the basis for the cons Convention on Biological Diversity, and everyone here comes from a country that signed and ratified this convention. So it should be a basic part of any risk assessment by definition. The other thing to understand is that risk assessment of GMOs will be species dependent, location dependent, and modification dependent, because that's the way ecosystems systems work. And this is a huge uh, uh, economic load on testing. People here were complaining about the time it takes to get permits. It should take time because all these specific conditions should be met. And I would say one last thing as someone who cares about the environment in this poor specific country. Uh, we are talking here about cost-benefit analysis. The way it happens in Israel, and I think that Israel is not unique, is that one person or organization or group of people get the benefits, and a totally other group of people or organization pays the costs. So many of these cost-benefit analysis could be pretty bogus, because people who are developers or manufacturers or perhaps also genetic engineers, know that they're not really going to bear the costs. And when we're talking about doing detailed risk assessment, detailed studies as should be done before releasing genetically modified organisms into the environment, one of the things that should be factored into it and into the cost benefit analysis is who is going to do the study, who is going to pay for the study, and who is going to do the long-term monitoring, because indeed 15 years does not tell us a lot. And we're talking here about a part of the world where there is no funding at all for long-term monitoring of any type whatsoever in terms of ecosystems and biodiversity. Thank Please you. remember, small country, large population, very difficult for containment or movement of genes. Thank you, and thank you also for fitting into the time frame. What we'll do if we have a few, if we have a few more minutes at the end, we'll see if we can have a time for more questions. But please, uh, Professor Leo Corey. Thank you. Well, being a historian of science and not precisely a historian of biology, but rather of mathematics, and uh, having only seven minutes to speak, I, I think I'll be very simplistic in my argument, but at least I hope to raise a point for further thought uh, in this complex issue. I want to uh, address the question of the historical argument for uh, the use or the development of uh, GMOs. And the historical argument was raised also here. I'll, I'll, put, I'll put it very simply. Biotechnology is nothing new. The use of genetic engineering to improve food crops is merely a natural extension of plant breeding techniques that have been used since time immemorial. Genetic engineering is just a faster and more precise way to improve crops than traditional plant, plant breeding methods. And then the uh, typical answer to that or the typical opposition to that is that while it is true that conventional breeding methods have yielded a wide variety of plants and animals that did not exist previously, the genes that produce those traits have come from within their own or closely related species, whereas modern genetic engineering can take genes from a species such as virus or a bird and place, it them, and place them in an entirely different species such as, say, watermelon. So this is the classical uh, debate uh, around this point, and I want to address this point from a completely different point of view, namely to look at the moral issues involved in straightforward forward breeding methods, traditional breeding methods before GMO. I could raise the point of human eugenics, which is, after all, some kind of breathing, but I would not like to go into that because that would be perhaps too explosive and it would uh, uh, move the attention away from what I want to say. But I want to mention a historical case, poss possibly not very well known here. Uh, in the uh, late 1920s in the Soviet Union, Ilya Ivanovich Ivanov, who was the leading expert in crossbreeding and artificial insemination in that time, he was world famous, cooperated with the Pasteur Institute, and he realized experiments on crossbreeding between human and anthropoid apes. 
1927, he inseminated three chimpanzee females with human sperm, and somewhat later, he repeatedly attempted to arrange further experiments on the artificial insemination of women volunteers with the sperm of Tarzan, who was a 26 years old orangutan male. Now, let me tell you, for example, that Charles Remington, a Yale biologist in 1971, compared the scientific importance of hybridization between man and chimpanzee with that of moon exploration or the first hair tra transplants. And today, with the recent improvements in techniques of artificial insemination, the possibility of such experiment to materialize become more likely. So let us think about the difficult ethical questions that may arise when faced with the possibility. For example, who would be selected to be the parents of the hybrid? Would the hybrid be regarded as human or as animal? Should the definition of the human species be extended to include anthropoid apes in that case? So you see that these questions touch upon the most sensitive of moral, religious, and non-religious and social issues. And we enter the thorny field of discourse on race, gender, ethnicity, etc. And all of this before we even started to consider more advanced techniques of GMO. Now, in the late 19th century, debate about degeneration was a major social and biological topic. The world involved the idea of a possible regression to a primitive and even animal state, and the threat of degeneration was found all around, according to the speaker's per perspective, and it was also widely used to justify racial, social, and gender inequality. Now, the case of Ivanov has to be seen against the background of the re revolutionary program for socialism in Russia, underlying which was an ideal under under white sorry underlying which was an ideology of eliminating such social inequalities and indeed in a very short period of time. It promoted the abolition of existing social taboos and it refused to see any social barrier or hierarchy as natural or inevitable. There was also the pressing drive to move quickly from a state of industrial and technological backwardness and to implement rapid and intense process of industrialization. So one can easily see why human ape hybridization experiments were more likely to take place and to receive government support in Soviet Russia than in any other context, I think, before or after. Now, the, 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 the details of this story are fascinating, and I can give you uh, the reference, to those of you who are interested, but uh, it's interesting to see how, uh, what kind of, uh, 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 of political and ideological uh, stances were behind that. Ivanov had, at the beginning, to elicit the institutional and financial support for his project, first in the framework of Tsarist Russia, and then he needed to, to move uh, to different kind of arguments within Bolshevik uh, establishment. And there is also an important point in the story, which is that there is a, mi a main technical milestone, which is, which, uh, which is the development of artificial insemination techniques that Ivanov continually improving his experimental farm, uh, uh, farm where he uh, breathed uh, horses with zebras and things of the like. So uh, um, um, at some point, um, he, he raised it in 1910, the idea for the first time an international congress of zoology and he one minute one minute yes i'll finish and he raised for the first time the the the, the possibility of using artificial insemination which would help bypass the ethical question that the natural pairing would pose the uh, there were in the end the the, the, the program failed not because of uh, truly uh, technological or biological problems mostly ideological technical i cannot go into all details but my point is the following i'm not trying to make a direct a direct comparison of the ethical questions posed by the existence of a certain technique and its application to a technical problem but what i'm stressing is the necessity to consider how the ideological political and social context of the issue has a direct influence on the way that the problem is posed and i mean here both sides also from the scientists who are promoting this problem Moreover, when we speak about the path from Mendel to GMO, this is not a direct and necessary path that took us from one place to another. There were many crossroads where decisions have to be taken, and in these decisions, the kind of ideological and political and social considerations enter. My feeling now, and now I'm speaking as an informed outsider looking at the current debate, is that such context is not sufficiently taken into account when analyzing the arguments raised for the pros and cons of GMOs. Thank you. I'd like to invite um, Dor Henin, please. Uh, I would like to make uh, three uh, very brief but uh, rational remarks. Uh, my first remark is on science, and actually it is in direct continuation what, 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 of what we write, uh, just right uh, heard. The GMO problematic is by nature 
a very information intensive issue. Science is very, very important here. But science does not exist outside, outside society. And speaking from social political angle, it is very important who controls science, who controls the research, the research issues, who controls the flow of information. Now, it is a grave concern that the arena we are dealing with is structured in a very unbalanced way. On the, on the one side, there are very powerful multinational concerns like Monsanto, Novartis, AgroEvo, DuPont, and few other chemical concerns who lately reinvented themselves as biotechnologically uh, uh, companies. They have a lot of power, they have a lot of money, they can really influence the scientific agenda. What drives them is the short-term profit for the shareholders. It's not a secret. It's not, certainly not, the long-term social concerns. Now, we heard here the claim that too few of the researches being done on GMO are really independent of any kind of influence of the industry. And that is, I think, something to worry about. And that is why such conferences as the one we have today may be extremely important if they can further promote relatively independent academic discussion of the issues and concerns we do have on this uh, problem. A second remark is on the Promethean problematic. The issue here, put in a nutshell, is do we know enough to revolutionary interfere in nature as we do in the GMO issue? I believe that our prudence should rise in direct proportion to our ability to radically interfere in the basic arrangements of nature. And that's the place, I think, the precautionary principle should come in. Do we really know the full scope of the unintended effects of GMO? There are a lot of un unintended effects, and I won't go into uh, examples because of uh, time limit. But do we really know the full scope of such effects? I shall not surprise you by saying that we are very far from that. And now to my concluding remark. Is there such a compelling social need to make us ignore all the concerns and really resolutely go ahead with genetic engineering? That brings me, of course, to the question of uh, world hunger. Professor Fyodorov uh, uh, before uh, quoted uh, the question, can we eat first? Now, is it so much needed in order to overcome world hunger that we should resolutely go forward with genetic engineering? Here I would like to say the following. There is a tendency, very well-known tendency, to seek for technological answers to social problems. This tendency might be in itself a problem if it helps to avoid the social issues in real life. Is hunger a really technical problem of uh, food production? As a matter of fact, we do have now much more food than we ever had. The production advances of the Green Revolution, for example, are no miss. Thanks to it, tens of millions of extra tons of grain a year are being harvested. But still, despite the fact that food production in the last 40 years has surpassed population growth by 16%, hunger persists. In some places, while the per capita 
food supplies rose, the number of hungry people actually went up. Back in 1986, it was the World Bank that concluded that an increase in food production does not necessarily result in food security, that is, less hunger. Hunger can be only dealt with, and I quote, ready, ready with distributing purchasing power and resources towards those who are undernourished, end of quote. That is what the World Bank study said. In a nutshell, if the poor don't have the money to buy food, increased production is not going to help them. Now, if the reason for hunger is not shortage of food, but social arrangements, social arrangements are the issue to deal with. Though, I think we'll have to... Okay, last uh, two sentences. And on this, unfortunately, we do not have technological shortcuts. We, what we need to seek primarily is not how to produce more food, that seems the answer to the wrong question, but rather how can we further reinforce the social inequality, which is the core problem. Thank you. Thank you. And our last speaker, Dr. Neil Droh. Thank you. Um, I have to say that I was in a predicament when I was asked to speak here uh, because uh, for the past day and a day, I would say, uh, from yesterday evening and today, I've heard how difficult it is for scientists to convey what they're thinking, their mode of thinking to the public. And I have to say that as somebody who teaches in a medical faculty, I have the same difficulties conveying to scientists what the humanities think about, what is our mode of thinking, why do we ask the questions that we ask, what is our logic. And I've written here for myself, okay, not to try in seven minutes to try to give a popular rendering of the way that we think about the natural sciences, especially not the critiques, not criticisms, the critiques that have developed over the past 35 or, or 40 years, the way that the humanities look today at the natural sciences. And this is what I teach. And as I said, I cannot give a rendering here. What I do want to uh, say, seeing as I am an historian of science, I do want to perhaps allow you to see some of the types of questions that we asked, and I will, uh, in a sense, repeat some of what has already been said here, since there are other uh, representatives who share my logic and my way of thinking. And I would look at, uh, for example, uh, as an historian of science, one question that I would ask, since risk is such an important a concept here that we have used. So one question that I would ask as an, as an historian, and there are books on the history of risk, is how is it that we have come to construe risk as we have? How do we define risk? And when you look at these types of questions, and I've looked at many other questions in the history of science, you see that the why and the how has much to do with our political, ideological, economic forces and interests. And I want to give you an example from a field that I know a little bit more and that is uh, the animal welfare science, okay? It's, and you'll see how it's uh, related. Uh, there is a history to the study of welfare in animals, a science. And if you look, there are journals on animal welfare science. And if you look at this field, uh, which began, let's say, in the 1950s, the 1960s, there is a science, a quantitative science of animal welfare, measuring welfare. And that science worked for many years and when we look at that science, there is one question that the science did not ask, one question which was assumed, and that is, what is welfare? And when we look today, that is, there was a natural sociological, social, historical reason for saying, when we ask what is animal welfare, then the science of animal welfare, being, it, it, it being itself part of a certain context, did not see that it was construing welfare in a particular manner. And what was that manner? If you look at the 1950s and 1960s, welfare is defined by science without a discussion of welfare, of course, as health and the elimination or 
um, of pain, okay? Pain was welfare. Now, anybody, anyone who is uh, familiar with the science of the wealth, science of welfare today knows that we have changed, that we have today many alternative definitions of what it means welfare, okay? We have being happy for animals. I'm not saying I accept these definitions. I'm just trying to show that we have very different definitions, which, um, uh, so I said being happy and giving animals uh, um, giving them the, um, the ability to carry out their interests, okay? So again, I'm not proselytizing here for this kind of welfare. But all I'm saying is that science itself cannot look at itself and assume, okay, it has certain assumptions about what is welfare, which it cannot ask itself. And this I see, at least, as part of our job, looking at the natural science, looking at the concept of risk, which I think is not far removed from the concept of welfare, and looking at why is it that today we are defining, how is it that we're construing the notion of risk, which is the basis of the science of risk, just like in the 1980s and 70s, people coming from the humanities began to look at the notion of welfare and saying, you're doing the science of welfare, but how are you, what are your assumption about, assumptions about how you are defining welfare itself? So this is one job if you're asking me, like, what can the humanities give to the natural sciences, okay, and not the opposite way around, is not for us to sit here and give you lectures about our way of thinking, but it is to sit and look at the basic concepts and what you're doing in the laboratory and tell you, first we need to decide about this, why are we defining things in a particular manner, what are the economic, political, ideological, because you can see that in welfare it's very easy to say, if you choose pain, or if you choose being, making the animals happy, okay, or if you choose health as welfare, then you're going to have very different experimental science in, and also very different looking uh, laboratories at our, at our uh, research um, uh, facilities. One minute. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, so if I have one minute, I will say that um, uh, the... Um, the questions that have been raised here, is biology the same over the past few hundred years? I have to say that you're not aware, I'm saying you people who are, uh, those who are arguing that there is a continuity, there is a radical change in your cognitive mindset. This me telling you'll have to take my word as it is. A radical change in the cognitive uh, mindset of biology during the last hundred years, and you're living experiencing that cognitive mindset, and you have to look at the 19th century where they did the same, but their cognitive mindset was so different that had you met somebody from the 19th century said, you're doing breeding and we're doing breeding, it's the same, they would have said, we don't even understand what you're doing, why you're doing, and what are your assumptions when you're doing it, and what your project is, and we have a different perception of nature itself. We're not doing the same thing. Thank you. Thank you. We have just a few more minutes if our speakers would like to respond to any of these comments. Yes, yes, see. Michael as well, so I'll try and uh, divide up the time. Very brief. Uh, no science. Uh, well, where are you? Uh, the simple answer for the money. Uh, okay. So, uh, Minister of Agriculture in Germany, Kunas, uh, no, she uh, didn't let science uh, prevail. And there was no experiment, no results, and that's it. Um, as uh, Dr. Kota, Dr. Kotas, um, Golden Prize Alternatives were checked for years, also in practice, and they were found to be um, not possible, not sustainable. Food and vegetables? Food and vegetables. I, I just no worry. What's food and vegetables? Look, uh, it's maybe too long to explain, but vast areas where uh, tens of millions of people live is covered with water for seven months during the year. And in the rest of the time, you cannot grow enough vegetables to provide vitamin A to the throughout. And, and there are others. And it was all tried with a lot of money, uh, donations and, of course, intervention. Uh, and uh, in your uh, utilitarian approach, I'll give you the, the magnogito. Uh, in the seven minutes of each of you, uh, according to my rough calculation, uh, four children died 
out of vitamin A deficiency and one went blind. So suppose this happened in Israel or in Europe. Would our attitude be different if golden rice was the immediate answer? That because I think that there is indeed, if, if we're looking at risks, there's a risk of um, being so much involved in, um, in imagining what the possible consequences are that we miss opportunities for, and the, the opportunities for, to develop actually benign uh, solutions to problems. So I think there's a risk of opportunities missed. Uh, that should be in in included in our deliberations. Um, okay. Oh, it's on. Okay. Um, I I only want to say something about this golden rice example. Um, let me say a few things. I guess uh, this is against um, the second speaker to the right, to the left. Um, I guess. Um, the, if you look to the world population, the increase of the next 10 years, 20 years, we will really have a problem of food shortage. So in that sense, we have to increase food production. So the second type of green revolution would indeed be necessary. And I guess we have to face this. We have to look for new varieties of hybrid rice and so on. There are lots of possibilities. Also in the GM technology, because I agree with uh, Professor Eastberg, that there can be really good benefits of GM. But we should be careful. It's a new technology that has lots of new risks that we should just take into account. Now the argument that people die can always be there. Always. It's in my view a very cheap argument. You cannot really put it on the, on the highest agenda because it could be that introducing this technology can have such adverse aspects without regulatory Without good regulatory process, you can have lots of adverse effects. Radiation in the, in the 20s and the 30s did a lot of medical work. And some people were protesting that radiation was finished, was stopped. But you can imagine what the side effects were. They were enormous. People were burned to death. So we have to take into account that the new technology has a fear risk. And we have to face that. And I guess it's not a good approach to minimize a priori to say that this is already a, new, a very old technology. Because on the one hand, the scientists are saying this is a new technology, it gives you lots of more fruits, it gives you lots more benefits than the old one. So in that sense, they are saying it's a new technology. On the other hand, that some of the scientists are saying, no, it is the same. And but why is it better? It is the same. Why does it give you an enormous amount of benefits that the old one just don't give? So the argument is flawed. So now let's go into the details of uh, uh, golden rice. I guess the newest uh, uh, development with respect to golden rice that you need a, a, a lot less golden rice is very interesting. It's still not on the shelf. Some companies are already advertising with the golden rice four years ago, five years ago. So they try to make a kind of PR uh, thing with it. But the golden rice has indeed lots of interesting things. But I guess don't forget that there are also other possibilities. The only thing I want to say, these other possibilities are, for example, fruits and vegetables, and you can improve vegetables, for example, also with GM. You can improve vegetables, for example, uh, a certain type of brassica, especially in developing worlds, are for 70% destroyed by the black diamond. The diamond black boss. And I have seen already interesting progress to improve the genetic, uh, the, uh, the, the genome of uh, Brassica uh, against this, uh, this moth. So there can be done a lot. But what is, the, what is the, the advantage of giving people seeds for fruit and, and vegetables? It's that they grow it themselves, in respect to small farmers. That's the main thing. That's the point. So that's the reason that we should have a diverse type of seed.
Uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers, um, and I'm sorry that we don't have even more time, because I know there are more questions, and I can see by, by the way people are shifting that they have reactions to what's been said. Uh, I have a couple of announcements. Uh, the researchers uh, who have presented their work outside will be until 1 o'clock next to their posters, so if you want to go talk to them, please do. Uh, I have to put in a plug also for the UK, and in the next session we'll be talking about nanotechnology, <coughs> and Professor Mark Wayland of Cambridge will present the report that was written for the British government on nanotechnology. And if you're interested in a copy of that report, there's a sign-up sheet at the registration table. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see how we can take what we've heard now into the next session and what we can learn when we deal with nanotechnologies. And the next item is lunch is served uh, to my left uh, at the end of the hall. Thank you very much.